Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm, uh, I'm sorry we're starting a few minutes late. Uh, someone preached along today. My apologies. Uh, let's see. We're going to begin in just a moment. Uh, but first, uh, for some news and notes, there's this new book I want to just share with you. It is a companion to what we call the LSB, our hymnal, Lutheran Service Builder. And you, you might know this, they have a few of these, but this one is called the Companion to the Services. So here's what's really cool. If you want to know, why do we have this thing in our church called the Kyrie? It tells you what the Kyrie is. It tells you the history of the Kyrie, when it was started, and why the church does it. it it's, a rather, it's a rather cool book, all right? So I bought one for myself. I was going to buy a whole bunch for a church and set them in the back that you could buy, but they're like $83. So I'm not buying 10 if you're not willing to pay for one, okay? <laughs> but if you look at this and you say, hey, that, that's kind of cool. I'd like to have that at the house. I'll buy you one. You could pay for it, but I'll buy them. <laughs> or you can go to CPH and get it yourself. But, but if I buy it, I think you get a deal, all right? So let me pass it around. If you'd like a copy, find me. But again, this is the history of what you might call the liturgy, all right, of our, of our worship service. So I'll pass that around. And if you don't get a chance to see it today during Bible class, I'll have it in the weeks to come as well. Uh, other things to share before we start. Last week, if you were here, I noticed that about 10 o'clock, nobody was paying attention to me. There were little kids screaming. Uh, I got to tell you, I'm not sure where their mothers were, all right? That was a, that was a little too loud uh, for Bible class. But uh, we're thankful all those other heathens are gone, and my son's going to be quiet today, so that'll be great. Um, so if you missed a bunch of Bible class last week because it was too loud, um, it, it's all online. So go to our church website. You can catch up on what you missed. Uh, today, we're going to be ambitious. We're going to try to get through three chapters. I already know that's not going to happen because we're starting a little bit late. Um, but this is perhaps in Revelation, one of the chapters you know. So chapter 12 is the text for a week called St. Michael and All Angels Day. That day happens at the end of September. Uh, when it falls on a Sunday, we often recognize that feast. Um, but that is the day when we celebrate Satan being kicked out of heaven. All right, That's the reading today. You'll probably be familiar with it. We'll talk about that and, and some more details as well. But as we get started today, join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your word, your word which creates life, your word which redeems life, your word which gives us promises of life to come. We give thanks, O Lord, that it's through this powerful word that you have defeated Satan and his evil cronies. We pray, O Lord, that as we study this great book of Revelation again, that, that it would be revealed to us your plan of salvation. May we not be scared of this book or of the message it proclaims. But may we read it confidently, rejoicing in the word and the salvation that you bring to your people. We ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, if you'd go to Revelation 6 today. Revelation chapter 6. I'm sorry, chapter 12. Okay. Revelation 12. All right, Revelation chapter 12. Uh, again, let me remind you, Revelation is symbolism. We're going to hear today people, images. We're going to hear numbers. And once again, our goal is to kind of decode those things. What do they stand for? What do they represent? Uh, we're not going to read today in a literal time frame. Uh, we're going to read here these first six verses. And I want to read the whole thing to you so you get a picture of it. And then we'll come back and talk about it slowly. All right? But chapter 12, 1 through 6. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. 
And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. All right, John sees two things, two signs. He sees a woman, and then he sees a dragon. Let's start with the woman. He sees a woman, and notice what she's clothed in. She's clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars. All right, I'm going to push on your biblical literacy. Do you remember in the Bible where there talks about a sun and a moon and 12 stars? And it's not the creation account. Joseph. Do you remember the story of Joseph? Joseph has, he's one of 12 brothers. And Joseph has this dream that there is a sun and the moon and 12 stars. And what are they doing in the dream? They're all bowing down to him. The 12 stars would be his brothers. The sun and the moon would be his mom and dad. All right? So in this dream, sun, moon, and stars bowing down this would be uh, his family. In the Old Testament, Jacob's family is often synonymous with all the people of God, right? It kind of stands, the, play, the people of Israel represent all of the people of God. And so here in Revelation, we get a woman, and then you get what she's clothed in. So who does this woman represent? The church, right? She represents the people of God. All right, so the woman gets to represent the people of God. Uh, she's pregnant. What do you, who do you think's in her belly? Jesus, right? And so you'll see other allusions, right? A woman who's pregnant giving birth to Jesus that often kind of sounds like Mary too, right? And so there, we get a, a couple images going on. So, so yes, we see allusions to Mary, but more than just Mary, Mary also gets to represent all the people of God. And she's pregnant, the baby in her belly is the Messiah, and she is crying out in birth pains. So when you have birth pains, is the baby there yet? No, it's a sign for the baby to come. So in the Old Testament, we get all of these prophecies of the baby who's going to come. So Genesis 3.15, you get the first one, right? The offspring of Eve is going to crush the serpent's head. Uh, you, get, you get more of them. I wrote a few of them down for you. Jeremiah 4, Micah 5. Micah 5 is a famous one we read during Advent. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, although you are least among the clans of Judah, from you is going to come the Savior. So the church has had the promise of a Savior. We've been promised the Savior throughout this whole Old Testament. And now the baby's going to be born. And who is the baby? Jesus. Okay? You with me so far? All right. So we hear the woman. Then next we see something else. And what do they see? A dragon. And now notice how the dragon's described. So what color is he? Yeah, red often symbolizes anger. Right? So this is not a cute dragon. This isn't a fun little pet you'd want to have in your backyard. This is an angry monster. Right? This is a bad guy. And then this dragon, you'll notice, he has seven heads and ten horns, and on his head, seven diadems. Okay, so what's going on here? If you go back with me to Revelation chapter 5, and go to verse 6, in Revelation chapter 5, we hear about the Lamb. And who is the Lamb? Jesus. And here we're told... And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. And then notice the characteristics of the lamb. Seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Uh, seven is this complete number. But you'll notice how the lamb has sevens. And then now what does the dragon have? Sevens. Well, think of the devil throughout the Bible. He is, St. John calls him the deceiver, right? The one who has been lying from the beginning. And so this dragon, in some ways, also looks like the lamb. 
We're going to hear about that a little bit more here uh, in, in verse in chapter 13. But, but this dragon, this beast, it, uh, it has characteristics of, of the lamb. Okay, kind of interesting. Then this dragon's got a tail, and the tail knocks out a third of the stars. Well, here in Revelation, we've been hearing about stars, and they symbolize different things. But, but here, the stars represent the angels. Okay? So when Satan, uh, you, you know, disobeyed God, when he left heaven in a sense, he took with him, we're told, a third of the angels. Now, remember with me, are numbers literal? No. So did Satan actually take a third of the angels? Maybe. We're not sure. But, but I, I think the point is he took a portion of them. Okay? Not half, not a majority, but when Satan fell, he took a portion of the angels with him. All right, then this dragon gets worse. Uh, verse 4, we're told, He stood before the woman who was about to give birth, uh, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Right? So what does the dragon want to do? He wants to devour the child. So, so think about this. In the Old Testament, there are many times throughout the story of salvation where Satan is trying to take away this family of God. If you go back to the Exodus story, remember Pharaoh? Right? How this all started. What was Pharaoh doing to the male boys? The male boys, the male children? He killed them. Throw them all into the Nile River. If you kill all the boys, what do you ultimately get to kill? You get a whole gener- you, get, you get to kill the seed, the promise, right? So, so Satan's been at work throughout the ages trying to devour this child. Uh, we, get, we get more of this too. Um, yeah, Haman. Do you remember the Haman story? That's the Esther story in the Bible. Remember when they're in Babylon, the Persians are in control, and Queen Esther becomes queen of Persia, and uh, Haman, King Xerxes' right-hand man, devises a plan to kill all the Jews. And Esther's going to come to her husband and say, hey, wait a minute, this is like my family. You, you can't kill your wife's family. And he agrees, he says yes, and he puts Haman to death. But if Haman's plan worked, what would have happened? All the Jews would be killed, including the seed, the promise. All right, so Satan's been at work trying to devour this child. Uh, Perhaps the greatest example of this comes when Jesus is born. You remember that story, Jesus is born, the shepherds come and worship him. Sometime later, wise men show up. And the wise meet with Herod first. They think Herod is a friend. And they're warned in a dream not to return to Herod. And when they don't come back, Herod figures out he was duped. And what does he do? He orders his soldiers to go into Bethlehem and kill every kid two years and younger. I think what we see here then, when we see evil in this world, Pharaoh killing babies... Hey man, trying to kill a whole, a whole uh, a group of people. When we see Herod trying to kill little kids, who's ultimately at work? Satan, Satan right? Uh, St. Paul talks about this in the book of Ephesians, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but the spiritual powers of this world. Satan is behind the scenes pulling strings, and he's trying to get rid of Jesus. Because if he gets rid of Jesus, then all of God's promises come unwrapped. You with me so far? All right. Uh, Good. But, verse 5, but she gives birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Uh, And that's interesting. That comes from Psalm 2. I wrote that in your sheet for you. In Psalm 2, we hear of this king that's going to come from David, and he's going to sit on the throne. And what is he going to do? He's going to rule with an iron rod. He's going to be the guy in charge. And so Satan's at work trying to kill the kid. Satan's trying to be in charge. And now here in Revelation, what are we told? Psalm 2 comes true. The baby's born and he's king. All right? And then continuing on in verse 5, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So when is Jesus caught up to God and to his throne? On ascension, right? 
So he becomes king. This is all about the ascension. He's a completed God's plan of salvation. He ascends into heaven, and now he gets to be king. We heard about that in Revelation 5. We heard that scene. Okay? So the child goes up, and now the woman, which is the church, right? This is us. She fled into the wilderness uh, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. All right, if you, if you remember from last time, if those kids weren't too distracting, we get these numbers, right? You get 1260. You get 12. Oh, this pen is worthless. Um, yeah, you get 1260. You get 42 months. And you get three and a half years. And they're all talking about the same thing. 42 months times 30 days, you get 1,260. Three and a half years, you get 1,260. And this is talking about what we might call the church age, that time between the ascension and that last day when Christ returns. Okay? So Jesus goes up into heaven, and the church now is here for this time period until Christ returns. All right, that, that's what we're talking about so far. Questions at this point? All right, now for some fun stuff. Verse 7. All right, so we're told, now war arose in heaven. And I want to make sure we get our timeline down on this. War arises in heaven. When does this war take place? Well, we'll hear a little more in a second, but it's going to take place at the ascension, okay? When Jesus ascends into heaven, and he's now king, uh, now war breaks out, okay? So there is war that arose in heaven. Michael, who is an angel, and his angels, the good angels, fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives, even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows his time is short. All right. Uh, I find this portion of Revelation gets people the most excited. Uh, it just sounds fun. A war in heaven. That, that actually sounds backwards to how it should be, right? We live down here below. Down here below is sin and evil and problems. And up above is supposed to be perfection, right? Right? So in some ways, it's like an oxymoron. What do you mean there's war in heaven, right? That just doesn't make sense. And why didn't they just finish the job and kill Satan? That's a great question. Did you hear, Maria? Why didn't they just fill the, finish the job and kill Satan once and for all? We don't know those answers, right? I mean, how come, how come he ever let Satan fall away to begin with? You know, we, we just don't know. But it's just not how God set it up, Right? So war breaks out in heaven, and this is interesting. We don't get the picture that actually swords are drawn and good angels die and bad angels die. It doesn't seem to be that kind of a war, okay? Uh, uh, but notice, Satan is cast down from heaven. Satan loses, and why does he lose? It's not because Michael, this archangel, is so powerful, and the good angels are the bronze, and the fallen angels are puny little wimps, right? That's not what's going on. But they, they lose because of um, 
Well, really, verse 11, okay? Verse 11 says, And they have conquered him, right? These good angels have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. So how is Satan defeated? He's defeated because of Jesus' death on a cross. All right? So we, we got to back up a little bit. This is kind of a... To me, it's a mystery. But when Satan first falls away and he shows up in Genesis chapter 3 and he leads Adam and Eve into sin, he's still allowed to be in heaven. Isn't that kind of interesting? You would think heaven's a holy place. Satan fell away. He, he would be a sinner. He wouldn't be allowed to be in heaven. But, but for whatever reason, Satan is still allowed to come into God's throne room, his courtroom. Right? God's the king, the father sits on the throne, and Satan's allowed to come, and he's allowed to plead his case. We get a picture of this in the book of Job. Do you remember in Job, Satan comes to God and says, you know, basically, or actually God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan argues with him. You think Job's so great? Yeah, right. I bet he falls away just like everybody else. Well, well, it's interesting. Satan, what's he doing? He's standing in the heavenly courtroom and he's accusing people. Job isn't as good as you said he was. Job's a sinner just like everybody else. Job will fall away from you. Just wait and see. And what's interesting, Satan, who is the father of lies, in some ways, standing in God's courtroom, he actually tells the truth. Here's what I mean. He gets to stand in heaven and he gets to say... Ralph Hall's not as good of a person as you think. Let me show you what he did just last week. He broke this commandment and that commandment and that commandment. And God, you promised to be a holy and just God. You promised that sin leads to death. And so what should Ralph Hall's fate be? Death. And he stands in heaven and he accuses God's people. That would be bad for you and I, right? Because we're sinful people and having someone demanding that we go to hell is not a good thing for us. And so how does Satan, he now gets banished from heaven, right? It's because of Jesus' death on the cross. And the death on the cross, the shedding of Jesus' holy, precious blood, it now covers and forgives my sins. So Satan can no longer say Ralph deserves hell, because as we've heard early in Revelation, what's special about Ralph? He's been sealed by God. Right? He has the sign of the cross on his forehead and upon his heart. He is forgiven by the Lamb. And so Satan might say he deserves hell. And then Jesus says, nope, he's mine. And so Ralph is forgiven. We're all forgiven. And Satan can no longer accuse us. And because he can no longer accuse us, he's got no business in heaven. And he is once and for all banished. Right? He can no longer go in the presence of God. He can no longer go in his courtroom. He's banished. And where is he banished to, unfortunately? Down here below with us. All right? Not so good. What about the first part? You got thoughts about that? You know, it's interesting, right? There's not a battle. Uh, th this is, I think, my favorite part about God. He doesn't need sword and shield and spear. How is Satan defeated? By simply the gospel, the word of the testimony. Jesus died on a cross, he rose from the dead, and it's that work of salvation that banishes Satan from heaven. You, you might think of St. Michael then as kind of uh, the bailiff, right? There, there's a jail setting, uh, the guy's guilty, the bailiff takes him away. That's kind of what happens. Thoughts about that? All right, um, good. Uh, so Satan's cast down... Uh, down to the earth, and there's a woe on the earth. And why is there a woe? Because Satan's here. And it's interesting, uh, this next point goes to the time is short, but, but Satan knows he's lost because the seed came, the promise came, the son of the woman came. He won salvation. Satan's defeated. And he knows he's lost. So what is now his goal? Well, in my last few days... I'm going to take down as many people with me as possible. And that's kind of pure evil, isn't it? I'm going to take as many people with me as possible. I kind of like this example. How does this kind of work? How come they didn't just finish off Satan? 
it's kind of like a bear in the woods stepping his foot in the bear trap, right? It's got its leg. He, he, he's done for, right? The hunter's going to come, and the hunter's going to kill him here soon. But for a short time, he's kind of chained up to this bear trap, right? He can get so far, but he can't get farther. And if we are, in a sense, dumb enough to come too close, well, the bear could still eat you, right? Although he's already defeated, he has a short leash for some time. And that's what we hear here then, his time is short. It's only 1,260 days. It's only 42 months. It's only three and a half years. Uh, the thought would be is it's not forever. It's a short time until Christ returns. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent in the, into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. All right, that's the first time we see that. We'll come back to that. And this serpent, right, dragon and serpent, same thing, poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river so the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So this dragon, Satan, now turns his attention. The goal was to defeat Jesus. He's lost in that. And now he turns his attention to, to us. Not good. He pours out water like a flood. And, and, and no, I know we've had a lot of rain recently, but, but that's not quite what it's talking about. It just means he's persecuting and affecting God's people. And the earth opened up and swallowed the water. Uh, that might be an allusion to, uh, in the Old Testament, there's a story of a man named Korah. If you remember this, God told Korah and, and all the people to get rid of all the stuff from the enemies they just took over. Uh, Korah kept some of that stuff for himself. Uh, and although he thought everything was hidden, who knew about it? God. And so he summoned forward in front of the whole congregation, all the people of Israel, he summoned forward. And do you remember what happens? the ground opens up and swallows him and his family and then closes, right? So perhaps an allusion to that, 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 that God opens up and he's sweeping away all of these false prophets and, and, and these uh, problems that Satan brings to his people. Uh, we're told the woman is carried away on the wings of eagles. Uh, we got a hymn, right? You know this, on eagle's wings. And I will raise you up on eagle's wings, right? Uh, I, that song alludes to the Old Testament when it was as if God cared for his people in the midst of the wilderness before the promised land. He carried them on eagle's wings. It's a, a symbol for deliverance and safety and refuge. And here God is going to care for the church down here still uh, before the last day. And, and maybe one more thought here. Why is he waging war on the church because we are people who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Um, this is maybe a little bit of a different line of thought, but, but perhaps you've noticed that Satan seems to attack Christians more than he attacks non-believers. Okay? If you haven't noticed that, just pay attention. Why, why do you think that is? The unbelievers are already going to hell. Right? He's not worried about them. He's worried about you and I. And so it's often said that when a non-believer becomes a Christian, their life might actually get harder because now Satan's eyes are turned on that person. Martin Luther said that when we baptize babies, what we do is we now make Satan pour all of his attention onto that child, right? We put that child in great danger in a sense, and yet they're marked by God and he's going to care and protect them. Thoughts about chapter 13, or chapter 12? Yeah. I have a question that it comes to me several times over the years, and I um, was just wondering how, if heaven was perfection, how would Satan come to be in heaven? I mean, how, I, I've never had a question to see how he became dissatisfied. 
No, it's a great question. And, and so the real answer is we don't know. But to fill in some of the gaps, uh, we know that Satan was a good angel, right, originally. Um, right? Lucifer means angel of light, right? Uh, it's partly how he's a deceiver. He looks like a good guy, but he's not a good guy. Uh, so he was good, right? So when God made the whole world, he made Satan too and all the evil angels. And sometime before the creation of the world, and, and chapter 3 when they all fell into sin, Satan fell. And so truth would happen pretty quickly, right? Because God made the whole world, and he told Adam and Eve to have kids. And when we get to chapter 4, they don't have a kid yet. So sometime shortly, the whole world fell into sin, and shortly before that, Satan did too. You're asking a question that I, that I think a lot of people ask, and I think it's good, because I don't always know people ask questions like that. And what I mean by that is we fill our lives with stuff so you never have to think about things. Have you noticed that? You stand in line at Walmart for two minutes, and you, you can't just sit there bored. What do you do? You pull out your phone and you read it. You sit in a doctor's office and what do you do? You, you play on your phone. You sit at home at night and you might watch three hours of TV in the morning and, or in the evening. And you never actually think about things. It's one of the reasons I love to cut grass because it's kind of a menial task. And you just have time to think. And when you think, you get to ask big questions like this. How did all this stuff happen? And it kind of drives us back to God's word. Uh, there was a pastor in the early church, St. Augustine, and St. Augustine's take, right, it's just a theory, but his take was that Satan wasn't satisfied being a creature. He wanted to be God, right? So I don't want to be, you know, second in command. I want to be in charge. And more than that, Augustine said that he believed Satan's real issue was that he didn't like that people were the crown jewel of creation. That, that in a sense, I mean, all of creation's good, but in a sense, people are more important than angels. And he was jealous of people, and so he went after people. That's a theory. We don't really know, but I kind of like that. That kind of makes sense to me, that he was jealous of Adam and Eve, and he came to take them down too. Yeah. But no, we don't know. Uh, maybe one more thought for you. Uh, I can make my kids come and tell me they love me, right? When they do something naughty, actually, and I have to punish them, and they get all huffy because they're in fourth grade now, and they get all mad. Uh, I make them come and give me a hug even if they don't want to give me a hug. And I make them say I love you even if they don't feel it right now because that's what we do. And God could make us do that. In fact, on the last day, we're told every knee's going to bow and everybody's going to know Jesus is in control. But as a father, it's much better when I walk in the door and they run to me and say, Dad's home, we love you, than to make them come to me. And so in God's, I think, perfect plan, he didn't make the angels have to do things. You know, we talk about free will. They had a choice and Satan chose the wrong choice. Yeah. Other thoughts about chapter 12? All right. Notice here chapter 12 ends this way. Where does Satan go? And he stood on the sand of the sea. Uh, truthfully, that's just bringing us now into chapter 13. All right, he's a good writer. He's, John's leading us into the next chapter. Uh, here in chapter 13, we're now going to hear about the people that help Satan. So Satan is wreaking war on God's people. And he uh, raises up people now to help him. All right? Um, and we're going to hear of two beasts I'm going to tell you right now, because we're not going to have time to talk about it, the beasts are not actual creatures, right? They're going to stand for something. Uh, another kind of cool thing, we think of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Here in chapter 13, we almost hear of what you might call an unholy trinity, the dragon and the two beasts, all right? And their goal, again, is to uh, wage war against God's people. So verse 13, we hear the first beast. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea... And notice its descriptions. Ten horns, seven heads, and ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its head. So the beast is connected to the dragon, right? They're connected. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. 
One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Right? 42 months, all the same time period. And it opened its mouth to utter blasphemous, or blasphemes against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also is allowed to make war on the saints, right? the people of God. And then this is kind of a hard one for us to swallow and to conquer them. And his authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. And if anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. All right, the first beast. What's the first beast symbolize? It's kind of hard to tell, okay? But notice how he's described. All right, especially verse 2. He looks like a leopard. Its feet are like bears. And its mouth is like a lion's mouth. All right, good Bible scholars. Back in the book of Daniel, Daniel often got to see visions of the end too. And Daniel sees not one beast, but four beasts. A beast that looks like a leopard, a beast that looks like a bear, a beast that looks like a lion, and the like. And here it would seem as if that beast is kind of all put together here at the end. In Daniel chapter 7, and I just wish we had time to read it, but in Daniel chapter 7, it is talking about political powers, kings that will rise up, Persia, the Greeks, and Rome. All right, the, these uh, leaders of the civil world that will rise up. And so here then, connecting that to Revelation, what is this beast going to represent? I think it represents all kinds of unjust political governmental authority. Okay, so one of the tools Satan uses to lead people astray is our government. All right, now let's be clear. The government is not Satan. That is not what your pastor said to you, okay? The president is not Satan. I'm not saying any of that. But is the government always in agreement with our Christian faith? No. You can see it pretty clearly. Abortion, transgender, homosexuality, all kinds of skewing of the, of the truth. And in an essence, what does our world do to all of these skewings of truth? They worship it. They love it. They call this out as the best thing in the world. Right? How progressive that we are, that we can have a drag queen come and read books to our children at the library. Right? All of these are tools of Satan to actually lead God's people astray. Now this beast has the authority to attack God's people. We, we feel it, don't we? Um, our schools are, are having to teach critical race theories and our schools have to teach pronouns and all this kind of trouble. It's a problem. And, and, and so Satan, the beast, is allowed to attack God's people. And then notice what it says. It can even conquer them. Now this, of course, would be from an earthly life perspective. So can the beast actually take our life? Well, sure. We think of the 12 apostles. All of them but John were martyred. Right? Rome, the political power, the beast of the day, killed all of these men of faith. But ultimately, were they conquered? Well, no, they have, they have a life hidden in God, right? They have eternal life with Jesus. They are the saints, the people of God. But, but the beast, the rulers of this world, can actually hurt and harm even God's people. All right, this is one of the tools Satan uses. Uh, we'll hear about the next one next week. Uh, but any closing comments about this first beast? 
All right, uh, again, hear me again. The government is not Satan. I just need you not to walk away and think I said that. Uh, next week, actually, we're going to hear something even more concerning. If the first beast is corrupt political government, then the second beast gets to be false teaching in the church. In fact, Martin Luther is going to say that in his day, he thought even the Catholic Church, the Pope, might have been the second beast. Uh, we'll talk more about what that looks like uh, next time. Uh, for now, join me in a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we recognize that as we live now in these 1260 days, these 42 months, these three and a half years, or perhaps better said, the age of the church, that it's hard. That we not only have to struggle with making life work, but we actually have Satan and his evil cronies firing fiery darts at us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would keep us safe. That you would send your holy angels. That you would send our Lord Jesus to come and to protect us and, and to keep us safe until that great day when you call us home. In the midst of all the tribulation, keep us faithful. That our eyes might be on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. That we might endure until the end and receive the crown of life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.